Yo, what is up, guys? You're listening to The Waver's Podcast, a podcast that answers the unanswered. We have a guest, no other than Mika Akimi, <laughs> the CEO of Blue Steel Racing. Right, so welcome. Welcome to The Waver's Thank Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, I think when was the last time I was on Waver's Podcast? Was it 2021, 2022? So yeah, quite some time Isaac ago. That time, right? yeah. Lots, a lot has changed since then. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Of course, every podcast I would like to improve, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, every episode we try to improve the quality. Like right now, we are we are live in person. <laughs> yeah, it's a good change. A good change. I saw also, Waivers has been having like quite, uh, you know, like like some new guests have been on the podcast yeah, uh, recently. Yeah. I saw Adele was on. Uh, uh, I think one of the PGR rookies recently, Adele, she was also on Waver's podcast, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm going to give you a brief summary of Blue Steel Racing. So. It is the most successful sim racing team in Malaysia, established in 2015, accumulating over 150 wins and 40 championships. It provides a variety of services other than just being a one-stop development center for up-and-coming sim racing drivers. They sell sim racing car setup uh, along with being a mobile sim rig solution provider equipped with the latest industry-level techs for sim racing yeah i think uh i i like how bsr has grown quite a lot uh since it started because the team has been around for quite long we were in uh malaysian sim racing even uh back in 2015 2014 uh and during that time uh sim racing was basically nothing in malaysia so we were there when uh, the team was, uh, you know, bas- uh, sorry, the industry was basically, you know, there was like nothing there, you know, no competitions around and stuff. There was only one or two competitions that were going around at that point. Right. Uh, so the team is in, uh, well, in esports uh, standards, it's it's quite young. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for, you know, the local Asian uh, sim racing scene, the, the team is quite old. Uh, the team is a lot older than... Uh, all the other teams that are around uh, in the region. Of course, when you compare it to Europe, there's teams like Redline who have been around since 2002. Uh, but sim racing was only brought on here, uh, you know, I think around 2012. Playbox, which I now co-own. Uh, Playbox at that time, it was owned by Edwin and in 2008, he was the one that brought sim racing over uh, to Malaysia. He bought a lot of simulators, brought it to a lot of events, and then he opened up uh, Playbox uh, in Arada Mansara. Right. So, sim racing as a market has only been in Malaysia since like 2008, 2010. Uh, and the members of BSR have been doing sim racing since that time. And then a few years later, they formed the team. So, the, team, the team's quite old. <laughs> right. Yeah, because if I could recall, I, I was nine during 2015. So, wow. <laughs> that, it, yeah, I was 12. I didn't even know about <laughs> sim racing at that time. <laughs> yeah, right. So let's get straight into the questions and not waste any, any more time. So let's go. Right. So what was BSR before you took over as a CEO? Mm. BSR, I think at that time, uh, it was just a fresh sim racing team. I think by the time I joined, it was 2019, I was 16. Uh, and I saw that the team had quite a lot of potential uh, because if you looked at the competitions that BSR were doing at that time, uh, there were not many competitions going around uh, in the Asian region, but BSR were winning like all of them. So I saw that the team had good potential, but I saw that it wasn't really being marketed as well because uh, once you sort of find out about sim racing a bit more, you find out about teams like Redline right. uh, and all that kind of stuff. And I thought that, you know, okay, I think for at least the Malaysian region or maybe even the Asian region, I felt like BSR could be that, you know, maybe not beat Redline just yet because they're, they're just like so big, yeah. but at least be, you know, uh, that dominant in the scene like what Redline is over in Europe. So when I joined in uh, 2019, the team didn't really have, you know, I would say any kind of strategic plan to mm. grow uh, they kind of just join whatever competitions they could and then uh, just try and win i felt like winning is one thing but showcasing your win is another which is you know marketing right. so when i joined i focused a lot on that <laughs> so sorry i should have muted no it so when i joined i focused uh on that as much as i could uh and you know especially modern day uh, focusing on social media creating content yeah 
uh, that's what you have to do, but it's also the biggest challenge. Mm. So I, I just focused on that, took over as manager between 2019 and 2020. Oh, I see. Joined Axel uh, for a brief period, and then I came back to Bustil with a bigger role to try and pull in more sponsors. Oh. So uh, between 2021 to 2022, I had, you know, uh, I sort of, that's when I started laying the foundations of how I wanted to build the team. And then right. 2023 onwards, that's when we really started to, um, you know, work on it a lot more. That's why you saw uh, 31st December of last year. So 31st December 2023, that was BSR's first time reaching 1,000 followers on Instagram. Mm. And now March 2024, we're at 3,000. So yeah. the team's growing really quickly. Yeah, to be honest, I, I, I was part of the weakness uh, <laughs> because of uh, my good mate Isaac. I yeah. think he's a big fan of BSR mm. and he, he told me about it. So I was like, wow, okay, this team, I mean, in my perspective, it really had potential. And you mentioned that you were in EXO for a brief period, right? Mm. So you joined BSR uh, right before you joined EXO for a while. Yeah, so I was with BSR for a year at that point. And then EXO, uh, they joined Le Mans Virtual uh, yeah. in 2020. Right. And they needed a driver that was fluent in R Factor 2. Oh. And at that time, I had the most R Factor 2 experience in Malaysia. I still do. <laughs> uh, and they, so Axel brought me on to sort of lead the R Factor 2 program. And I stuck around with the team after that. And, you know, really, I would say I grew a little bit there, learned quite a lot at Axel, but I wasn't too happy with the limited growth that were there. Uh, which is why I wanted to sort of build my own thing at BSR and focus my uh, my growth efforts there. So, if EXO did everything correctly for you, right? Mm -hmm. Would you ever chose to join forces with BSR ever again? Uh, no, I think uh, BSR right now, it in any sense, it wouldn't really benefit from any sort of partnership or collaboration. Uh, because the only way we can do something bigger is if we partner with something, some team bigger like Redline or Williams and stuff. But even then, it wouldn't make quite a good geographical sense because they're over in Europe. Mm. So for us to really grow properly, we'd need a partner in Asia. And in Asia, there's not a lot of big teams. Yeah. Uh, so any kind of growth, uh, it won't grow BSR, but it will grow the team that is partnering with BSR. So... <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm not here to grow anyone else's company. I'm here to just grow BSR. So uh, that's why uh, I don't think any sort of partnership would uh, would benefit the team. Right. Awesome. So let's move on to the next question. Very well, well, well answered. <laughs> right. So how do you think BSR has established itself to become the most successful sim racing team in the country, separating from competitors like Jota Sports? Exo Motorsports and many, many more. Yeah, I think, uh, of course, another really competitive team in the region uh, is a Singaporean team called Legion of Races. Uh, and BSR and Legion of Races, we have a lot of things in common. We have members that started, you know, in the early ages of sim racing. Uh, and if you look at Legion of Races, they also do a really strong, uh, you know, they have really strong social media effort and they do a lot of uh, emphasis on content. So our biggest competitor is them. We don't really have another competitor that matches our numbers in the country. So Legion of Races is what we want to try and beat uh, in the uh, Asian region because they are doing really competitively in a lot of competitions as well. Uh, LOR are very competitive on ACC. We are very competitive on R Factor 2. So, uh, you know, that's mainly, you know, in terms of how we differ from our competitions. It's really more about how we grow the team because uh, let's say if we compare to something, a team like Axel Motorsport uh, or Axel Sports, they don't really have a team member that was you know, in sim racing pre-2021, 2019. Uh, so you know, the knowledge that they have is quite limited and they're quite new to the scene, uh, meaning you know, they haven't racked up as many wins as we have. You know, we have over 100 wins before... Uh, before Axel even won the first championship. So we were there since the start, and I think that's crucial to growing a team. Uh, you need people with experience like Ame Hazik, Sim Kai Wen, uh, Ayman Hazik, people who have been around from the early ages and really understand the industry uh, inside and out. But also you need uh, young talent 
like me who come into the team uh, focus a lot on <laughs> on the marketing uh but also you know you need to spend a lot of efforts really not just finding the right talents but also nurturing them so you know Sharik is a new member of BSR who joined in 2022 Shazizan also joined in 2022 Iman Danish joined in 2022 as well so these are very bright talents uh but bright talents will dim and fade quickly if they are not nurtured correctly so as a team what i focus a lot on is really understanding what each driver is like because right. every person out there that you'll meet they'll react differently to different things and they'll practice differently uh and they'll respond to your treatment differently and stuff so i focus on understanding each individual you know a lot more and at a deeper level so that when i coach them or when i put them together in a team uh you know so that we can compete i can extract more out of them because i understand more uh from them which was my biggest limitation at axel because over there they always thought that the best athlete and best racing driver always followed a set of rules uh oh. and if you didn't if you didn't follow those rules and if you didn't react a certain way then you wouldn't be a good athlete and to me i thought like that would limit a driver's creativity by a lot uh and if you don't understand what makes them you know unique and what makes them individual then you're taking away the individual aspect of the whole thing so i think that's the biggest differentiator between us and the, our competitors is that we we focus a lot more on what makes each driver unique mm-hmm. that's great right so speaking about drivers right bsr has experienced and talented drivers so are you planning to expand your team your roster and what are you looking for as a scout uh yeah we are actually planning to acquire more drivers but maybe not in the next 6 or 12 months because you know sometimes having too many drivers is not a good thing you can't really have uh, enough eyes and enough mouths to really coach uh, all these drivers um but sometimes you meet a driver that's really you know you can't help but snatch <laughs> so uh when our, i think our latest signing was Iman Danish uh and at that time we were kind of tied uh because uh if we added on another driver uh of course that means our sponsors would have to provide for another driver right uh, but also as a team when it comes to coaching and practice we would have to allocate another driver into the roster uh and sometimes when you have one person running everything and too many people to look at sometimes some drivers can feel left out mm-hmm. but uh in 2022 uh me and Iman Hazik did a lot of competitions on iRacing and Iman Danish was challenging us for the win uh in every race that we did and at that time he was racing with Hyper Bulls so oh, we thought to okay. ourselves if we don't sign him he's going to be a bigger problem for us in the future because he's going to be competing against us so so we took him on uh but i think you know the next driver that we sign i think we're looking for someone with a bit more creative depth someone that can of course have you know a wide range of skills someone that's good across all different simulation platforms but also someone that thinks you know outside of the box someone that maybe on social media they're a bit more active and they like to speak their words uh, a bit more which is a good thing we want someone that can really uh, attract people you know some drivers uh, they like to run their mouth quite a lot and some teams don't like it uh, yeah. because it gathers too much attention but sometimes you just need more people to look at you because it makes your team more fun <laughs> so if i have a driver that's quite quick but is a bit of you know has a bit of an attitude problem and riles people up right i would actually sign him uh as soon as i could because uh it'll get people talking about you a lot more and it's just more interesting to have someone like that in the team and someone like that will often uh rile up the, your competitors a lot more get in their heads a lot more yeah. so i think someone like that uh because there's too many drivers out there who are boring you know you see i don't want to name any drivers but some drivers when they win or get on the podium uh the way they speak after the way they <laughs> post on social media after is like really boring uh, the you know so i don't really want to go for a driver that's boring because even when you practice with them it's going to be boring and <laughs> it's just going to suck the life out of the team yeah uh, so i I'd, i'd be happy with taking a driver that maybe doesn't have quite high uh, 
ability at the moment, but if they have a lot of potential and they're fun to work with, I would I would take them up uh, to join the team. Right. So I mean, at the end of the day, um, sim racing and racing in general is, is a entertainment industry, right? Yeah. Sports is an entertainment industry, so. I'll be interested to see who's the <laughs> next driver. You can bet that they're going to be someone interesting for sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, I'm quite curious, right? T tell me more about the company's directions for the upcoming years. Is it transitioning into actual track racing? Yeah, I think BSR would definitely be more attractive to the general public if we you know, do a lot more physical stuff. Of course, uh, we'd be nothing without our sim racing. Uh, and... In general, um, it, sim racing gives you a lot more international exposure hmm. because you're competing against drivers from all over the world. So your team name and the drivers' uh, names are said, you know, and you know, seen at a larger scale if you do sim racing because you just reach people from different regions. But in terms of having a pull factor. Um, hmm. We're planning to have our own track car. Uh, like right now, we have our Honda EG6 that we yeah. use for track track purposes. But you know, if we can one day buy a Radical, an F4, or something <laughs> that we can use for track days, and it makes us a lot more attractive. So that's our business goals. Uh, we're also planning to have a race cart that we're gonna have in BSR colors and stuff. Wow! Just for content purposes, <laughs> <laughs> just so that we can uh, well one burn a hole in our sponsors' pockets. <laughs> Uh, do a few track days, uh, have the team work on the go-kart a little bit more, but having something physical like that that we can make content off of and just have fun in, I think would make us very, you know, even more different uh, in, you know, in sim racing. So that's our goals. Uh, but these things, they cost a lot of money to run uh, and it requires a bit more financial planning. Yes. Maybe the next yeah. driver that we bring into the team, if they are, you know, if they are, well knowledge financially I would have them on board so then they can help out with the financial side of, of the team uh, but yeah that's that's what uh, the team is planning to do uh, for the future because you know we have quite a steady growth plan for, for sim racing at the moment uh, as well as social media so we already have a set plan on um, what we're going to do so the next step is to continue running our Honda track car and if that is successful, acquire another track car on top of that. So then we can increase our track day uh, visibility. But now we're, we want to do something more, more grassroots. That's why we're getting the go-kart uh, to, to run up as well. So that's, yeah, I think the team is known as, you know, the leading sim racing team in Malaysia, uh, you know, quite strongly now. So I think the next step is to give uh, the people that follow our team something new to look at. So I think the go-kart uh, will, uh, we, will be a good addition to that. Damn. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. A lot of planning. <laughs> yeah. the team. <laughs> Especially how um, big the team is getting yeah. every year, every month. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's good. I like seeing uh, the team grow uh, that, that well. Right. So up to the next question, right? So share this with, Share us some glimpse of BSR's sim racing coaching sessions. Like, what are the programs like? So, we have, uh, I would say it boils down to two scales. One for beginners and one for the more competitive sim races. So, the beginners, obviously, um, they know sim racing and they know how to drive. They see F1 uh, and they see the different, you know, driving techniques that different drivers use. Like, for example, uh, people notice Ayrton Senna's weird throttle bipping technique. Uh, or maybe how Max Verstappen is a bit more aggressive with his wheel while Hamilton is a bit more smooth. People see that, but they don't really understand why these drivers are doing these things. So for the beginners, we teach them a lot about the weight transfer, about you know uh, the difference in heavy braking versus like sort of progressive braking. We teach them the basics because there's a lot of physics and vehicle dynamics that go behind into just driving the car, let alone going quicker. And for the more competitive and experienced sim races we dive deeper into you know let's say if you're uh, we're doing coaching uh, in the LMP2 on R Factor 2 we teach them a lot about why you know having you know really aggressive initial braking is really important in these cars compared to other cars um, but we we mainly do our coaching sessions online 
Oh, because okay. a lot of our clients are actually like European or American based um, wow. people yeah so they want to do their coaching sessions online uh, and for the team from a business point of view financially it's more profitable for us to do online coaching because if we charge them let's say 20 20 dollars an hour yeah. to them 20 dollars over there is like 20 ringgit over here mm. so it's like it's like nothing to them yeah. the 20 bucks but for us 20 dollars is a whole 100 ringgit exactly so, so it, uh, if we do coaching, let's say a group of three for two hours, so that's already like sixty dollars an hour over two hours. It's one hundred twenty dollars. That's six hundred ringgit of coaching just from one session. Yeah. So financially, it's uh, it's better for us to do online coaching, but uh, when we do that, we're only tapping into a market of sim racers that already have simulators are already quite well known. Uh, uh, they already quite understand sim racing to a certain level. Okay. So that means your market size is not so big, mm. even though the money is good, which is why now we're doing a lot more community races uh, at Cove. So we are now exclusive partners with Cove uh, over in Banda Sanwe, where we'll do our community races and we'll also do coaching, mainly targeted to beginners who don't have sim rigs yet. So we'll coach them on uh, starting on the F1 game and then we'll move to ACC as well over, the, uh, over there. Teach them a lot about the basics of racing and everything. And this is where we target the beginners a lot more. Of course, we don't make as much money compared to our online coaching, but it's more about building up the community base for sim racing and also mm. finding out new talents. Because, you know, there's always that question of, oh, what if there's a really good sim racer out there just without a sim racing rig? So right. that's what we're doing at uh, at Cove, trying to locate these talents and right. trying to really, nurture them. Yeah, nurture them up uh, to a competitive level. Right. Okay. So, what is one challenge, right, you face as a CEO, in terms of diversifying the whole team, the process, and everything? I would say the biggest challenge is just the time and energy that it takes, because. Uh, to run a sim racing team every week, I have to obviously update the sponsors on how everything's going. Mm -hmm. So I have to schedule meetings. Uh, it's, you know, preferably they would always like to meet uh, in person. So a two hour meeting really takes up like four hours of my day. Uh, one hour to get there, two hours of the meeting, one hour to get back. Uh, yeah. And that's uh, not including them inviting out for lunch or dinner or whatever. So sometimes it takes up to six or seven hours of my day. Wow. Uh, and that's just for one sponsor, one client. Uh, <laughs> I'm talking to, I mean, right now we have like two major sponsors and clients, but I'm meeting up with two, three new clients every week. Uh, okay. And that adds up over the course of a month. And wow. I have to keep myself updated with all these different people. Uh, some people, I meet with the CEOs, uh, but then they want me to plan with their marketing team. Okay. And then that takes a lot more time. Yeah. So that's the biggest challenge. Sometimes I feel like... Uh, uh, what you know, I'm a bit stretched out in what I can do, uh, but I wouldn't really hand down the task to uh, a different person in the team because then uh, the sponsors wouldn't really know who they're talking to. So that's the biggest challenge. But you know, it's it's a part of business. Uh, I read in a lot of articles and I listen to a lot of podcasts. I think Richard Branson was saying something like, "You you talk to fifty clients, then you'll land one." <laughs> so. Uh, it happens sometimes you just have to go out there because at the end of the day even if you don't close a deal you you build the connection yeah. so in the future they'll think of you uh when their goals align uh so i think that's just the biggest challenge any team owner business owner shop owner will just face the challenge of managing your network connections and resources uh in that sense uh so though that's a challenge for the team i find it a fun one you know going out <laughs> seeing sponsors <laughs> Right. Is it known that, um, is it out there that perhaps you are the younger CEO of a sim racing team <laughs> in our country or probably internationally? Yeah, probably. Because uh, I used to uh, I used to be one of the sim racing drivers in RSG. And RSG are a you know, pretty huge esports organization in Malaysia. Okay. So whenever I meet people uh, in the esports industry in Malaysia, people that are running like, uh, PUBG teams, Mobile Legend teams, or whatever. Yeah. They're usually young, but they're not like my age young. <laughs> so oh, whenever okay, they okay. see, uh, you know, see me running teams and everything, and they will always say that I'm quite young. Yeah. Or when I meet with new sponsors, like recently, 
I had a call with uh, Kiva's marketing team. Okay. Uh, Kiva is an energy drink from Japan. Right. Uh, and when I was pitching to them my ideas and I was showing them my deck, the first thing that they said was that they were really surprised that all this information was coming from someone as young yeah, as yeah. me. And they were saying that uh, the way I present myself, the way I talk when it comes to talking about you know a sponsorship deck or talking about a proposal, they were saying it was very professional. And it was surprising to see someone of my age doing something like this. Uh, so I guess I can say, at least from what I can see, I would say I'm quite young to yeah. compared to everybody else around me. Uh, and I quite like that because I feel like that means the way I run things is different compared mm. to you know, the industry standard of what everyone else is doing. And it makes the team more interesting. <laughs> right. uh, that's just the whole goal, really. I don't want to have another large-scale boring company out there. I want to have something fun, something people look at and, you know, they really feel the energy around it. Uh, so, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Man. Well, I really admire how you schedule everything. <laughs> college, your social life, uh, just PSR. Be, I mean, of course, I want the team to be different than every other team out there, but I want myself as an individual to be different from every other 21-year-old out there. Respect. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's just about you know, I think you can, I don't know if it's ego, uh, <laughs> probably is, and I don't mind it, uh, but it's just competitive nature, you know, you want to be yeah. different to everyone else around you, and you know, if that means doing different things and piling up your schedule, and by all means, you know. <laughs> right. That's great, that's great to hear from yeah. your perspective. <laughs> yeah. Right, so, let's talk more about uh, a more chill topic, right? Mm -hmm. Um uh, Let's move on. Let's uh, go. Let's sidetrack a bit. Mm -hmm. Right. So, in what way, right, does BSR differ from local and international competitors? When I mean international, like, as you said from the beginning, Redline and Williams, right? Mm -hmm. So, how do you, like, differ from them? Mm, yeah. So, that's actually the biggest question that I always ask myself every time I look at BSR's marketing plan. Because if you look at Redline, it's easy for them to market themselves because they've got Max Verstappen. Exactly. Uh, Williams is very easy for them to market themselves because they're an F1, F1 team. team. So how are you going to be on the scale of these teams exactly. if you don't have yeah. what they have? Because even Axel, they have an XF1 driver in there, mm. right? So you have to be different. So that's why if you look at BSR social media, uh, we started to change. We realized, okay, Sometimes uh, simply making coaching videos and stuff is boring when you don't have a personality. Uh, so we started pushing out a lot more funny content. Uh, and uh, that content you know, gets us a lot of views. If you look at our reels, 500, 200, you know, 1,000 views and everything. Yes. Uh, yeah. You get more numbers looking at you because you're funny. And then right. eventually when you put out uh, you know, educational content, more people will tune in because they go... They you know, they engage with you for your funny content, but then they stay for your coaching sessions. So that's wow. how we're doing things differently at, at BSR. And it works because, uh, you know, okay, I don't mean to put uh, any other teams down, but, you know, comparison is how you grow, uh, yes. uh, grow a company. So if you look at the way we do it, we focused a lot on putting out funny content on social media. And then once we gathered the viewership and the followers, we put out, you know, community events. Okay. So our first community event, we only had eight slots because uh, Cove only had eight simulators on their second floor. Within 10 minutes, all eight slots were sold out. Whoa. And Dang. some of them were from people who already knew BSR, but the rest were all from people that knew BSR from Instagram. And then our second community event, uh, we wanted to fill up the eight spots again. So we put on social media uh, the, co the community race that we did uh, at Cove. And then we got one, uh, we got like, you know, a few comments, a few DMs of people wanting to join. We just sent them the link and then straight away they showed up and they were at Cove the next day for our community event. Wow. And they wouldn't have found us if it weren't for our educational content. So like okay. I said, you, you pull people in with your funny content, but you make them stay for your coaching sessions and stuff. If we just, if we only posted our coaching uh, content, not many people would care because they wouldn't know who we yeah, are. Yeah, that's true. So, so you get the interaction that way. And when you compare... Uh, because Axel also have a lot of club nights, they call it, or community nights. And I think recently, uh, one of our friends that are also uh, in Axel, they said the community nights had two people coming, which were 
uh, just like one guy and his son. Uh, <laughs> and if BSR had that, I think I'd hate myself. <laughs> so I love the fact that, you know, but if you look at how Axel run their social media, it's very different. They only put out coaching videos, yeah, uh, racing tips and everything. And then their viewership's often under 1,000. Uh, and, you know, if we did that, we'd have the same numbers. And when we put out our coaching or community nights, we would struggle to get numbers as well because we just don't have a personality, which is why we opted to go for educate, like funny content first, uh, educational stuff later. And it helps us fill up our community races and stuff. So you can see that's how we differentiate ourselves from our competitors. But that's on a local scale of like, you know, building up physical numbers. In terms of uh, international uh, stuff, we, we do have to create a different plan uh, because over in Europe, they're not, on TikTok as much as the Asians are. Uh, so we have to do, you know, maybe a bit more live streaming on Twitch, uh, a bit more uh, content on YouTube. So we're planning to do some YouTube uh, vlogs soon about our racers. Uh, because me, Aman Hazik and Iman Danish, we will all be racing the Honda Jazz in MCS. So we're going to make some vlogs around that just to document it, put it on, on YouTube. Makes us a bit more different than every other team because these European teams, they might have, you know, the name of being, you know, an F1 team or an F1 driver or whatever. Uh, but not a lot of their sim racers are doing real-world racing. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. how we can be different to them. And we, re- we will plan to make some videos around that that we can post on YouTube. Because then people from outside of Malaysia, from European or American countries, they'll see, oh, these BSR sim racers, they're also racing in the real world thanks to what they're doing in sim racing. So that's the best way we can grow ourselves uh, internationally. Cool, man. Wow. <laughs> if it executes, yeah. wow. <laughs> yeah the, I mean, planning is one thing. Execution is another. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah that's also another challenge. All right. So, what is one memorable moment with BSR that you would cherish? Oh, last year, uh, we were the first Malaysian team to win uh, the team's championship in uh, esports endurance series okay so esports endurance series it's i would say it's one of uh the most competitive leagues out there on r factor 2 it's only slightly below uh vec and lmvs because if you look at the teams that are competing in esports endurance series or ees um the teams that are competing in ees are also the front running teams in vec division one and they're also you know the people that are racing in vec division one you would also find in Le Mans Virtual. So you okay. can rate EES quite highly up there. And in the season five of EES, we spent the whole year battling with Simpreme for the championship. And Simpreme, you know, uh, not sure if you know Freem as a company, but they, they're kind of like Alpine stars. They make racing gloves and okay. everything. So Simpreme are very well known uh, and they're very competitive, uh, very highly ranked in the European uh, sim racing, uh, you know, sort of like competitions. So for us to go head to head with them throughout the entire championship, and we only won the championship by like five points uh, back in season five. Right. So I think that's my proudest achievement because no other Malaysian team has done it. No other Malaysian team has won a championship in, uh, in EES. Uh, and that really put us on the map because every team uh, that you know, was competing in the European regions, now they saw BSR as, you know, a proper force in the European competitions because of our championship winning campaign uh, in ES Season 5. And you can see the direct effect of that in Season 6 because uh, Simprim immediately, instead of running just one car, they had two cars in the championship for the mm-hmm. hypercar category just to beat us. And in the previous season, they had a hypercar and a GT3 uh, program. Okay. And they got rid of the GT3 program just so that they could focus on hypercar just to beat us. Wow. And our competitiveness in hypercar also led more teams to join ES because even Blackhawk joined after us. Uh, Mugen, of course, they doubled their lineup. So you can see, uh, you know, once you start winning, everyone wants to start beating you. Yeah. Which is good. It's good for competition. Uh, and, you know, the importance of that is when every team out there is trying to beat BSR, it really just brings the team's name up. Even if we can't beat them in certain races, at least we'll be known as the team that they're trying to beat. So I, I can say our growth in the European region is uh, growing quite well. 
but the next step is obviously to try and get into Le Mans virtual and really be on that uh, big stage. Cool. Right, so you're not just a CEO for BSR. You are a also professional driver. driver. <laughs> and you yourself has, uh, have a portfolio mm -hmm. of achieving the fastest lap <laughs> at 2023 Le Mans virtual 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was with Rocket SimSport. So Rocket SimSport is Jensen Button's uh, sim racing team. Oh. So okay. I did... Uh, in the last season of LMVS, I did the first round with Bah, uh, with in Bahrain with Brabham Esports. Uh, we finished eighth in that race against like you know loads of top teams like Porsche, uh, you know Redline, Williams, Red Bull. Uh, we finished eighth in that first race. Uh, but I was only a sort of substitute driver for Brabham at that time. Uh, and from Monza onwards, uh, Rocket SimSport needed a driver to fill in for the rest of the season. So they signed me in. Uh, we had quite a lot of technical difficulties basically the whole season at Rocket. Uh, had a lot of disconnections, had a lot of hardware issues. So we were never really able to uh, maximize on our potential. But you could see how strong we were as a team because even in Monza, we spent the first half of the race uh, in P10, P8. I was in P8, P12 consistently battling with Michi Hoyer throughout the entire race. So you could see our potential was there. We just didn't have the luck. Um, but in that final race at Le Mans, we had bad luck and we had a disconnection on the first lap. So to have a severe disconnection on the first lap of a 24-hour race is, of course, you know, a terrible yeah. thing. Uh, and by the time we rejoined, we were about 70 laps down. Whoa. Uh, so there was nothing to fight for anymore <laughs> at that point. Uh, you're 70 laps off of the next car in front. So we were like, it's okay, we'll just keep racing and we'll just go flat out see how good we are, uh, how competitive our pace actually is. So when I was in the car, I was just driving as good as I can and I got the fast lap. <laughs> so uh, even though our race had nothing to show for, I still came out of that race as the only Malaysian to get a Rolex fastest lap award. And wow. I don't care how many people will like, uh, you know, brush over that fact. I will ride on it as long as I can because no other Malaysian's done it. And I don't care how many people are going to be salty about it. I'm still the last one to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So you mentioned about the team transitioning into possibly transitioning into track racing, right? Yeah. That's one of the future plans. So do you think one of the plans uh, would be part of, part of, like establishing one, one, one small cutting team yeah. in BSR? competing in SWS? Yeah, I think uh, it depends on which direction we want to go because SWS means that you kind of race uh, their carts, right? So yeah. that's that risk of, you know, some carts are you know a bit more worn than others and that's stuff. True, so that doesn't yeah. make it so fun. Uh, but it is fun that everything is like quite equal. Uh, but I do like the idea of owning the cart that I'm going to race. So Ayman Hazik actually has one go-kart uh, that he's not really using for almost two years now. So we're planning to spend our money to do that go-kart up and compete in maybe KRD or other competitions. Uh, and the difference is if you own the cart, it gives you more um, marketing control. You know, you can wrap or paint the go-kart in your own team livery, put the sponsors on and everything. So in terms of making money, it's better that way. Uh, in terms of making content, it gives us more freedom. So I'm a bit more inclined to do something like that. Um, but I won't deny that competing in SWS as a BSR team is a pretty interesting thing to me because you can still kit the whole team out, even the helmets to have BSR colors. And if you win, you really stand out with, with your colors out there. So that's something I want to do. Uh, but, you know, karting versus same racing. Because karting, even if you're the best out there and you create really good content, uh, your viewership's only be gonna be limited to the people that are in your region, uh, and your achievements are only gonna be limited to people in that competition or in that sort of like so vicinity. Yeah. yeah so, uh, like I said, in sim racing, if you win a championship in sim racing, uh, especially something like EES that's you know globally you know globally held, uh, your name will be known in a lot of different countries. This like Simprim, they're mainly a Hungarian team. Uh, okay. Blackhawk, they have members from, mainly from Spain and Germany as well. Uh, and there's other teams that are mainly Italian-based. ES itself is Italian. Uh, 
uh, and there's many teams that have you know German drivers, Dutch drivers and stuff. So if you win, these drivers will be thinking, yeah, this BSR team from Malaysia won. Uh, and every driver from every team will be thinking that because if they finish second or third to a team from Malaysia, they'll know that the Malaysian team has won. If you look at when I did Le Mans Virtual, when they showed all the drivers that were racing in the race and my name was in the top five, right. only you know, every other flag there was like German, Italian, Spanish, all Europeans. Then Europeans. you'd have one Malaysian flag there that stands <laughs> out, right? Yeah. So the fact that in a grid full of Europeans, you have one Malaysian flag standing out, you know, that's a, to me, at least I see that as a huge factor. And I feel like BSR representing Malaysia in that sense, uh, it brings me more value than something like ES, because, uh, something like SWS, because, you know, you could have three, four, five drivers all finishing, you know, one, two, three, four, five in SWS, <laughs> but your name's still going to be limited there. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, I would only consider having a team in SWS if it doesn't take energy away from my sim racing team because the sim racing team is really where we get our name out there and you know the value is bigger there uh, so if I build an SWS team that's competitive all just for you know only people in SWS to know about me to me it's like you know it's it's not as much fun. I like when more people from outside of Malaysia know about the team. So having a team in SWS is only like an afterthought in my opinion. Right. So speaking about the popularity of the whole motorsport industry, mm -hmm. whether it's sim racing or not, do you think the popularity has uh, increased or rise due to the Netflix series. Yeah, definitely. F1 series, Drive to Survive. Yeah, because the um, biggest problem in mo Malaysian motorsports is just there's just no viewership. Uh, back when F1 didn't have Netflix, the grandstands were like, what, 40,000 people? Uh, only the last race in 2017 had like 80,000 people. But if you look at MotoGP, you can get 100,000 people yeah. easy. So, mo you know, four-wheel racing in Malaysia has never really been popular, but it's been growing uh you know massively thanks to uh, f1 and netflix um our partners at cove said a lot more people have been coming in to play f1 ever since uh you know f1 has partnered with netflix so the growth is good um but you know how many of that will translate into actually growing the local motorsport scene is uh, is another thing because uh you know if you have a lot of money to start a motorsport team in malaysia and you win everything that you can in Malaysia, like you win Toyota Vios Challenge, you win Malaysia Championship Series, you win uh, MSF, uh, Malaysia, Speed, uh, Malaysia Speed Festival, you win all of that in front of empty grandstands, and it's no point. So I feel like motorsports in Malaysia, you st there's still a lot of room for growth. I think every team that does Malaysian motorsports uh, has to focus a lot more on marketing and building a fan base. Mm. And if BSR had a race car that we can use to compete in MCS, in Toyota Vios Challenge or whatever, we'd focus 80%, 70% of our resources on marketing. Because if you don't build that fan base, you become a giant in an industry with no fans and there's no point. So uh, I feel like a lot of teams in Malaysia that currently are racing in these series, they are not uh, taking advantage of the fact that a lot more people are watching racing because of F1 and Netflix. And I feel like that's a big mistake. I feel like, you know, if you focus more on uh, pulling in uh, people to watch motorsports in Malaysia, because I think I, I find it very interesting that championships like MCS, uh, you have a lot of different teams taking cars that you see on the road, racing against each other to see who's the best. Uh, but not no one's marketing it. Uh, even MCS uh, viewership is like quite low. Um, but I'm hoping that would change. I'm hoping, you know, maybe if uh, something like MCS, if they can do Netflix style documentaries, it would be quite good as well. Get it on TV or whatever. Build the uh, crowd. That would be good. Uh, I feel like the growth is there thanks to F1 and Netflix. But I think still a lot of room for improvement. Right. I think. That's a wrap for today's episode. So, Ooh. yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for no coming, Mika. Happy to be back. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you'll be back for another episode in the yeah, future. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully by the time I'm back, 
Biasa has maybe like 10, 20,000 followers. Yeah, then we <laughs> can talk about it. Last time I had 300. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Because I remember I checked last time I was on the Waivers podcast. Biasa had like 300 followers. Oh, Now we have 3,000. So maybe the next time I join, we have 30,000. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Then we can talk more about yeah. BSR and your personal growth as a driving yeah, racer. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that's good. Shows that there's been good growth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, hopefully the podcast as well. Yeah, definitely. Right. Man. Yeah, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you.